I, I can assure you that that is by far the most dangerous introduction that I've ever had. Uh, luckily, I stay next to Mary Robinson, you know, and she says, Kishore, after you get such a tremendous build-up, it'll be all downhill after this. <laughs> so be ready. In fact, I'm actually very surprised uh, that Thierry chose me for this very important address. Uh, I suspect he's trying to destroy the myth that he's infallible. <laughs> so I'm going to prove he's fallible today. But I have other challenges uh, in speaking to you today. And the biggest challenge I face is that I've never been as optimistic about the future as I am today. I think that the next 20 years will be the best 20 years that our world would have ever seen. And I'll explain why. By the same time, to make my message credible, I have to address what's on your mind, so I have to address what's in the zeitgeist of today. And as you know, our zeitgeist has never been as pessimistic as it is today. You pick up the newspapers, you turn on the TV sets, you get doom and gloom. And I'll try to address why we feel this doom and gloom, and then I'll explain to you why, despite these feelings of doom and gloom, great times are coming. That's what I'm going to do. So why are we facing this doom and gloom? And I have come up with an explanation that the reason why humanity at large feels a bit lost in today's world is because we are trying to manage at the same time three significant historical junctures. Managing any one of them would have been a challenge. Managing all three is a huge challenge. And as I describe the three of them, you'll understand why. But even before I begin, I must to reinforce the point that Thierry made. As a good Asian, I still have to do the right Asian thing and apologize to my Western friends. If I make you feel uncomfortable with some things I'm going to say, but at the same time, if I don't take you out of your comfort zone, you will never understand the world that is coming because the world that is coming is a world outside the Western comfort zone. And I hope to also prepare you for that. So what's the first historical juncture? The first historical juncture, and this is why actually it was brilliant for theory to choose the topic of global governance, the first historical juncture we are facing is that the world has changed fundamentally. And how has the world changed fundamentally? I explain it with a very simple metaphor. You know, before, when you live in 193 separate countries, you live in 193 separate boats, so you needed rules to make sure that the countries and boats didn't collide with each other. And that's what the 1945 rules space order was all about. But today, the world has shrunk. And 7 billion people on our planet no longer live in 193 separate boats. They live on 193 separate cabins on the same boat. But the problem we have is that we have captains and crews taking care of each cabin, but we don't have a captain or crew to take care of the global boat as a whole. And if you accept this metaphor, you'll begin to understand why we face so much pessimism. Because all the challenges all the fundamental challenges that we face are clearly global challenges, which demonstrate day after day that we are 
on the same boat, right? Just before the session, Jacob, Il Sakong and the rest were saying, you know, housewives in Korea wake up to read about what's happening in Greece. Why? Because we are on the same boat. And when a financial crisis explodes, none of us can be immune from a financial crisis. Similarly, the number one challenge that we worry about today is global warming. And you cannot solve global warming by sitting in any country or any cabin of the boat. You have to get together as a whole and find a solution. Similarly, if you have a pandemic, it respects no borders. It travels, viruses travels across borders effortlessly. So day after day, we are given evidence that we are all on the same boat. And what do our governments do? Do they take care of the boat as a whole? Or do they just focus on their cabins? And if you look back, even over the last few years, there was only once, at the height of the financial crisis in April 2009, at the G20 meeting in London, when all the leaders were aware, finally, that we were on the same boat, then they came together and launched a coordinated package that saved the world in 2009. But as soon as the crisis was over, what the leaders do again they again focus on their cabins. And just ask yourself, as you have discussion after discussion on the G20, ask yourself a simple question. Which G20 leader goes to a G20 meeting and says, hey, how do I save the world? Or is he thinking, how do I improve my ratings at home so I can get re-elected again? So the primary focus of each leader is on his own cabin. And that creates a structural problem. And the structural problem is that we need leaders to take care of the boat, but instead we have leaders who take care of the cabins. And if I may say something even more heretical here, we all know that democracy is obviously the best form of government, and there is no alternative to democracy. I acknowledge that. But let us be honest. Let us also admit that some democracies, including, sadly, the democracy of the most powerful country of the world, the United States of America, may have become dysfunctional at a time when we expect American leadership to take us through an economic crisis, a climate crisis, what is the mother American leaders doing fighting each other at home? And just a few months ago, as you know, they brought the world to the edge of the cliff by arguing about the debt ceiling. And the economists had a wonderful cartoon that showed the Tea Party leading the, leading the Republican Party by the nose, the Republican Party leading the uh, United States by the nose, and the United States leading the world by the nose. And you could see how a small, special interest group could bring the world to such a dangerous point. And that's the, tra that's the tragedy, the difficulty we have of dysfunctional democracies. So as you analyze this situation, with the world becoming smaller and smaller, and the leaders becoming narrower and narrowly focused on their work, you can understand why we feel pessimistic about what's happening in the world. 